these are very, very difficult segments to do, especially when it's someone that you knew personally. And uh, I, I don't really know how I'm going to do it, so I'm going to just do it how I always do things in this world, and that is to give you the history of this person and everything that they've done importantly in this Transformer world. And this is a this is a very big loss. This is a huge loss to the Transformer community and even just the artistic community as a whole because there was still so much left on the page to be filled. For people who aren't aware, uh, Derek Wyatt, one of the head driving forces behind the Transformers animated toy line, cartoon, character designer, colorist, storyboarder, writer, Everything, man of many hats, passed away just a couple of days ago. The news broke via colorist Joshua Perez on his Twitter, and he got the information from Derek's sister that he had passed. We don't have all the information on what has happened, but we do know that the world has lost a very important individual. So... I talked with different creators, people that knew Derek, people that worked with Derek, people that me and Derek have hung out with, and we kind of wanted to put together a little bit of a just quick little just history lesson of who he was and what he did, and... I have a, a statement here from Aaron Archer also, Aaron, who worked very closely with Derek during the creation of Transformers Animated. Uh, Aaron wanted to give a little statement here through the podcast, as well as uh, just my own personal adventures with Derek and all the thanks that I want to give him for putting up with this punk kid that he had to deal with more than 10 years ago. So let's start from the beginning, shall we? Uh, Derek was born in Paw, Paw Michigan, and uh, an artistic mind. He went into the Joe Kubrick School of Art, where he was actually taught by one of the famous Transformer and Marvel comic book artists, uh, Jose Del Delbo. And talk about luck right there, right? Eh? And in that school also was uh, Kim uh, Del Melder, who uh, worked on Swamp Thing with Marvel. And he was under their influence and when he graduated from that school he started his internship at Spunko in California moved all the way over there and those were the people that were behind Ren and Stimpy and one of his first little projects that he got to work on as an intern was the Spunko show The Ripping Friends if people remember that back in the day uh, after he was done his time there with that company, uh, he would go on to work for Warner Brothers, and that's where he did his first job there with them, which was the Mucha Lucha show, if anyone remembers that one, where he got kind of his first big break. But it wasn't until he worked on a very special show that really put him on the map, and that was the Teen Titans. And what was special about that one was it was Derek's chance to kind of reinvigorate that brand for a whole new generation of people. And I argue to this day that as much as characters like Raven and Starfire and Beast Boy and, and Cyborg have one iteration that was known through the comic books through the many years with George Perez and many other people that worked on those books and New Titans, when Derek came to it and reinvented that brand, uh, it became the staples of how people imagine Starfire, Raven, Beast Boy, and the like to this day. And still exists, still reverberates to this very day. Amazingly, after all these years, uh, with Teen Titans Go! and the Teen Titans Go! movie, which is, everything is still, still to this day, still around. So what he created back then still echoes on the DC world of things and it influences it. 
After that, uh, you know, he did some small animation jobs here and there, but then landed on Transformers Animated, which was his dream job because he had a huge love of the Transformers brand since he was a child. And he got to now finally work with a lot of those Transformer alumni that he only used to just imagine of back in then. And, uh, man, like... I'll get into the whole animated stuff in a moment, but afterwards, you know, then he would go on to work on Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, Ben 10, Wacky Races, and more. Too much to list. But it was when he was with uh, Transformers Animated, it can't be understated what he did for the brand. We were coming off of the Michael Bay movie, a whole new hype for the Transformers world, a whole new audience of people that were going to have eyeballs on the Transformer brand coming off of the Unicron trilogy. And Animated was going to be our first Transformer series with this new generation of fans and this new interest. And he was one of the first examples of a childhood fan of the brand getting a strong say in direction of the ship whether it be design, story, and even that of character voices. Derek said that he was very lucky that he got to work with Sue Blue, the voice director of Animated, who was the original voice of Generation 1 RC, and how he can make requests. Hey, could you get this guy for this voice or get this guy for that voice? And she was really good at finding them. That's kind of how we got, you know, Judd Nelson for Hot Rod. My man, <laughs> you know? So it really showed uh, how much he, he wanted to make sure that this was a love letter to the fans, and you really saw that with Transformers Animated. Uh, I mean, it's... Jerry Seinfeld said it the best, is the best creative works are the ones where you leave on top wanting more. And Transformers Animated is one of those series where it left on top. It ended on a high note, it ended with peak interest, and fans were screaming for animated season four or more figures and wanting to see more of Derek's vision of where that would have gone. And we never got that. We never did get that burger bot scene that he told me about where it would be him, excuse me, it would be Hydra, me, Vangelis, and the angry archer all sitting together eating. <laughs> never did happen. Would have loved to see that. Um, he had a lot of ideas for season four. It's it's just such a shame that, you know, we won't be able to see any of that come from his pen. It's, it's crazy how, you know, we lose artistic creators in the Transformer world, but sometimes it's long after they've finished, you know, their work with a brand. And... When they pass away, it's a tragedy that they passed away, but the tragedy is their passing and how much of a great person they were. It wasn't so much of also what could have been put still on the page. And in the case of Derek, there was still so much work to be done. So much. That if only the stage was given to him, the opportunity, you know he would have grab that paintbrush and just would have splashed away artistically and everything like that. And he never stopped. Look at Joshua Perez's Twitter as well as Derek's Twitter. And I, we've reported this a lot of times on the podcast. There was two segments I did, I think, last year, or was it this year, where they were just creating all kinds of amazing shattered glass interpretations with animated stuff. It was fantastic, fantastic stuff. Uh, where do I go from here? You know what? I'll, I'll get, I'll, Aaron Archer gave me a statement that he wanted to say, maybe I'll save it for the end. He sent it to me. He really wanted to make sure that as many people could hear his words. And he felt that, I guess the podcast would be the best place for it. Not even his own, but sure. I'll do that for you, Aaron. No problem. It's only... Only worth it to celebrate such a, a talented individual like like Derek. But I guess I'll just go, like, the first time I met Derek was at BotCon 2008. Uh, it was a Friday panel 
where they were talking about Transformers Animated. Transformers Animated was very fresh, very new at that point in that, you know, that summer of 2008. And uh, I remember sitting in that panel and it was, you know, again, still the early days of that new breed of fandom now that was created by the movies. So Bakhan still wasn't as crazy packed as it was in the later years. And I remember just sitting in that Friday animated panel and Derek was there and I didn't know who he was at the time, but he talked about how, you know, he wanted to put Hot Rod or Rodimus Prime in the show. And ultimately, the end kind of evolved into what became Sentinel Prime and how it, Sentinel Prime, in a lot of ways, character wise, almost was Rodimus Prime. So imagine Sentinel Prime with his douchey personality would have been Hot Rod or Rodimus. And then they just kind of ran with Sentinel Prime instead, and you know everything fell together with that. After that panel was done, I remember going up to him and introducing myself and thanking him for uh, for not making Sentinel Prime Rodimus Prime, because I don't think that would have worked out well uh, for me. But I still like Sentinel Prime. Who am I kidding? Uh, and you know we laughed about it. And uh, we talked back and forth after that panel ended because he had nowhere he had to go at that point. And we talked about other influences that I saw that were there, like a lot of anime influences and, and go bots and stuff like that. And we hung out at the bar that Saturday evening. Sadly, it was so loud at the bar that <laughs> that Saturday at BACON 2008 with everyone yelling and stuff. But we didn't get much talking done. But we, just, we hung out. We hung out and talked. And that kind of created that bridge there. Uh, we exchanged cell phone numbers and, at the time, Skype to continue talking over the summer and fall. Uh, later that year, Derek told me that he was going to be designing Hot Rod and that he was going to be being put in the show. Uh, at the time, it was called Hot Rod. He didn't know what the final name would be. And uh, he was going to imply he was going to put some aspects of me in it. And I had no idea what he meant at the time. I had no idea what he meant. <laughs> And it sounded exciting, though. I don't know. Uh, in October of that year, we got to see the first line art images of what we call Rodimus Prime. And uh, I got a text message from him, and I still have all the text messages on my phone to this day. And uh, it's, he said, look at that flared collar. And what he was referring to was because when when Derek first met me, I was wearing a Hot Topic Hot Rod Flame Chest shirt, a Matrix necklace around my neck, skinny jeans. That's his word, skinny jeans. I don't think they were that skinny, Derek, but skinny jeans and an extremely flared popped collar, which a lot of my attire, especially back then, was my arrogant punk self that I was that crazy bastard uh and so apparently th that visual aspect of hot rod was because of me yeah I, I i still don't understand it but sure i guess because he knew that it was my favorite character and he wanted to kind of add a little bit of splash to that he did that with a lot of fans again hydra one of my buddies from japan he had his own character design put in the show. Half Hydra, the Master Force character, and but yet visually Hydra, the real-life person. Same thing with Vangelis and a few others. I'll never forget getting a text message a week before BACON 2009. And it's a picture of him holding the prototype for animated Rodimus, or is the test shot, excuse me, the unpainted test shot. Uh, and holding it all coy in the image with the caption under it, Jealous Bitch. You can't hate him for that. <laughs> uh, it's still, I have an old flip phone from that in 2009, and it still has that image on there. I will never throw out that flip phone because of it. It was also one of my first cell phones. Um, oh, man. Like, I'll never forget that. Oh, my God. Later that year, um, Derek came to TFCon Canada. It was his first TFCon ever in Canada. 
Uh, and he did a live slag podcast in front of the dealer room and kind of next to the bathroom too, which was bad placement on our part. <laughs> uh, and we talked about giant robots, what he wanted to buy that weekend. He was hunting for GI Joe manimals and street sharks. Uh, the man had good taste. We both shared a love for bad eighties and nineties toy lines. And it was something that we shared also with uh, fellow artist, artist, Eric, uh, excuse me, Eric, uh, Joshua Perez, just the love of those weird kind of toy lines. I know when we would go to Bacon, uh, I have this great photo of me shopping with him and we were looking at all, like this one guy just had all this like bad 90s toys and he was buying all that crazy stuff. It was a great time um, at that TFCon though. He sat in the front row of my Japanese Transformers animated pa panel and marveled at the madness that was Kiss Play. <laughs> when people still didn't really know what Kiss Play was. Uh, he also brought some cell sheets from Transformers Animated, which were, uh, keep in mind, like Animated was done digitally, so they had like line art that they would then digitally color. And he had a whole bunch, so I bought a Prowl and a Sari from him. And uh, his self-published self -published art book that he did uh, called What? With a question mark. I still have that. But the real gift that he ever gave me was he gave me the original sketch of Rodimus Prime, the head sketch, along with an original sketch of what he would interpret a Rodimus Magnus would have looked like for season four for his supposed, and I use air quotes here, bad future episode that never happened. We would talk back and forth for years, again through Skype and then, you know, later MSN Messenger and, and uh, Facebook. Two dudes living on opposite ends of the continent. Him going through all the crazy stuff in his life, socially and everything going on there, as well as discussing anime and stuff that he watched, like Gao Geiger and Gurren Lagann and Mighty Orbots, Japanese dub, of course. Uh, and I would even get him on the podcast from time to time the old version of the Transformer Slag podcast he was on quite a few times. Those episodes are somewhere out there. I know it was like episode 35 or something was definitely the first one he was on. Uh, every time I'd be in the West Coast, whether it be for cons or whatever, we'd grab a bite. Me and him like to eat. We both like to eat. Uh, half my photos of Derek that I look at uh, are us in restaurants eating some kind of fancy sit-down burger joint or Asian fusion, whatever. Um, I always seem to spend more money on food when I'm hanging out with Derek than I am on toys, oddly enough. But food is good, and food is always a connection with so many of us, I guess. Uh, he came back to TFCon a few times, always trying to hunt down the animated toys that he never got because Hasbro didn't really give him any. I remember him looking for Activator Cliff Jumper, or having to broker a deal for him uh, for a Windblade Optimus Prime. And I remember I forget I forget which seller it was, but I remember like the deal was like uh, he gets the figure cheaper, and we'll get Derek to sign all the other animated figures, you know, to make it more valuable. I remember that story. Uh, I remember him buying me a present. He he found this T-shirt that one of the sellers had. It said Matrix inside, and it kind of looked like, if anyone remembers Intel, they used to have like the Intel inside logo on computer towers. It was like a sticker. So they did like a Matrix inside parody version, and he bought it for me. I don't know why. Uh, maybe the Matrix connection, the, the hot rod thing. It was a red shirt with gold on it. Uh, maybe as a thank you for all the years of geek talk at the bar and the restaurants and the lobbies and late night Skype calls at 2 a.m. Well, 2 a.m. for me, West Coast for him was probably just midnight. Um, I love that shirt. Still have it to this day. I have a photo of me and him shaking hands together proudly wearing that shirt. Uh, later on, him and Josh, like I said, would go on to do crazy stuff with coloring with the Transformers animated and Shattered Glass Jam Sessions, which I documented on the podcast because they were just so cool uh i mean a lot of that was found on his twitter if you want to see some of his creative stuff that was just ongoing that he was doing privately it's all on his twitter and i kind of regret just 
not having him back on the podcast in the new era of Transformer slag. But, you know, that's always the case of regret is you don't know it until it's too late. Even though he, you know, he kept keeping animated flowing. It's... Uh, fuck. It's tough. I just want to close this out because I, I don't want to go much more longer because this, is, this isn't an easy one to do. I just want to just read a statement from Hasbro head lead designer, the man, Aaron Archer, during that time when he worked with Derek. He gave me a statement here to say for you guys because he worked very closely with Derek with the development of Animated. Aaron has to say here, <clears throat> the most informed partner I've ever worked with about Transformers, both in lore and toys. He brought his childhood love of the property to Transformers Animated's project, and we were the better for it. Transformers Animated is a love letter to the fans, and Derek's passion and visual style made it one of the most beloved Transformer series of all time. He was a great partner and friend, and to the fans, his work will exist across multiple animated franchises long before his passing. We mourn the loss of someone as talented as him, Aaron Archer. And it is true. It is true. We will miss him. And there was still so much work to be done. There really was. I will miss you, my friend. 